assuming a fair number of you, including myself, listening to or thinking about Huprazine A, want to know, well, you know, I don't have Alzheimer's, thankfully, um, but maybe I'm trying to get one more hour of productivity out of the day or have better witty banter at parties or make better decisions during meetings or think more quickly have better memory recall don't be saying oh what was it? what was his name right so those sorts of things hey everyone let's discuss hooperzine a and why i feel this brain supportive supplement is one that you should at least consider for improving cognition learning and memory I'll break down what Huperzine A is, where it's derived from, how it improves your brain health, cover my personal experiment with it, go over what the research has told us about who should and maybe should not use Huperzine A, and then give you a protocol you can try at home, borrowing from what I learned what you should do and maybe shouldn't do in terms of getting the dose right, because this does seem to be one potential tripwire with using Huperzine A is the dose and the frequency of dosing. Okay, so let's break down Huperzine A or Huberzia serrata is the name of this moss. So it's a compound naturally derived from a moss actually discovered by the Wiseman Institute in Israel in the late 90s. And what was so interesting about how this was discovered is at the Wiseman Institute, they were doing 3D modeling of the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. This is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And when doing the modeling, they discovered a notch in this enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, that Huperzine A docked into, and by doing so, reduced or inhibited the breakdown of acetylcholine, therefore allowing acetylcholine to build up in the brain. And I'll weave in, of course, why that's important in a second. But let me start with this quote by Joel Sussman. It is as if this natural substance were ingeniously designed to fit into the exact spot in acetylcholinesterase where it will do the most good. Now, acetylcholine ties into memory in part, not limited to, but in part, because the hippocampus is very dense with acetylcholine receptors. And the hippocampus is really where we convert short-term to long-term memory. And you'll see as an example, and also where some of the research has been done in Alzheimer's, literally a shrinkage of the hippocampus and just the brain in general which is where and what underlies some of the memory and kind of impairments that occur in Alzheimer's. So as you can probably imagine, if you inhibit acetylcholinesterase, you have a buildup of acetylcholine, you have better neurotransmission, and this can include neurotransmission in the hippocampus, but also in other areas of the brain. This is in part why we see from this really uh, cool schematic which uh, depicts the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Evaluation. And this is what's been used in some sort of pre-post evaluations of Huperzine A. The ability to, or at least potentially, the ability to favorably impact orientation, short-term memory, and then a cluster of things probably more relevant to those watching or listening to this, executive function, language ability, abstraction, and attention. And if you're trying to either be witty at a, at a party, let's say, or make good decisions, then abstraction, attention, executive function, these are really important facets. And this is what the Montreal Cognitive Assessment evaluates. And it's been used as a pre-post measure in some of the research using Huperzine A. We also see an increase in miracle grow for the brain, aka brain-derived neurotrophic factor. 
And we've discussed in the past how things like exercise and sauna can increase BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And as you can probably infer from the name, this will literally lead to growth and or better connectivity within the brain. So we have increased acetylcholine in terms of one mechanism, increased brain-derived neurotrophic factor as another mechanism. Uh, and then also interesting and very important is reduced inflammation. There's actually a reduction in microglial activation, which are immune cells in the brain. And when there is too much inflammation in the brain, this can correlate with things like brain fog or with cognitive impairment. And I also just wanted to share what I found a pretty telling schematic from the International Journal of Molecular Science that gives you a few other of the mechanisms. They're multifold. I don't want to bore you with all of them, but you see neurotransmitter regulation. Like we talked about, you have increased acetylcholine. You see improved mitochondrial function in part due to less reactive oxygen species, that's the ROS, and improvements in levels of ATP energy. You see neuroprotection, where amongst other factors are improvements in the levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. You also see facilitation of antioxidants like GSH or glutathione uh, and a reduction of inflammation. So there is a lot happening favorably from the use of huperzine, at least mechanistically, but we want to make sure to tie in do we have outcome data showing benefit? We don't want to just let our love of physiology totally blind us to the fact that this compound may not have much merit in terms of if you actually use it, it may not be very helpful. So it's crucially important that we look at the physiology and the mechanisms, yes, but then we got to cross check and say, does this actually move the needle clinically for people if we have that data? Now, if we don't have that data, all we can do is speculate, but when we do, we gotta look at it. Before we go there, I wanna share my experience. Uh, I'm actually on 200 milligrams of Hooperzine A right now, and, or I'm sorry, uh, micrograms, not milligrams. What I've noticed with Hooperzine A is a very acute effect, similar to caffeine. And if you look at the pharmacokinetics of this, you'll see peak levels in the blood by about 60 minutes. So similar but different to caffeine in that it's fast acting. And because of this, I really put Huperzine in a category unto its own to some extent, wherein let's compare that to maybe something like Bacopa or Ginkgo that amongst other mechanisms improve circulation, beneficial, good, and there's research to support these help with cognition, but it's not in quite as an acute way that huperzine A does. Huperzine A, again, similar to caffeine, due to its quick ability to take effect. At least that's what I've experienced. I will say, again, the, the benefits are notable, but they do not come without a cost. The cost was, for me, insomnia. I felt great all day, couldn't sleep at night. And this is one of the things that can happen if you have too much acetylcholine. So, you know, you have to kind of pay the piper somewhere. And if you over optimize for one thing, attention, you may not be able to sleep. So we'll cover this in the protocol, but you can get around this by either reducing the dose or dosing every other day. And this is in part because the breakdown or the half life of a seal, uh, not a seal coding, of a Hooperzine A is about 20 hours. So if you're dosing this every day, you can have it build up. And that's what happened to me. The first day or two were kind of the honeymoon. And then I started having poor sleep. Now let's go to the research. There's sort of two buckets we can look at this in. Overt disease states, Alzheimer's. Impressive research there. In fact, there is a 2022 umbrella meta-analysis. So this is a summary of meta-analysis. So very, very accurate and high quality summative level of science, finding clear benefit for Alzheimer's. And this led the researchers to conclude as follows, quoting, due to its efficacy in improving cognitive abilities, we believe that Hooperzine A can be employed as a first line treatment. So pretty powerful stuff pertaining to Alzheimer's. But 
assuming a fair number of you, including myself, listening to or thinking about Huprazine A, want to know, well, you know, I don't have Alzheimer's, thankfully, um, but maybe I'm trying to get one more hour of productivity out of the day or have better witty banter at parties or make better decisions during meetings or think more quickly have better memory recall don't be saying oh what was it? what was his name right so those sorts of things now we don't have any research in truly healthy populations but what we do have is the next best thing or perhaps the most proximal condition and this is in a model known as MCI or mild cognitive impairment. This is not a full blown disease state as Alzheimer's, but people will have failing or fledgling memory in different domains. And in this area, there is some interesting research. And this is where I pulled the Montreal cognitive assessment from as a pre post measure in some of the MCI or mild cognitive impairment research, which again is going to be probably the closest to the audience listening to this in terms of maybe you have some brain fog, maybe you have limited mental endurance, if you will, and you're trying to optimize for that. Now, as an aside, I should make a really important distinction. As someone who suffered from food reactive brain fog, I wouldn't say if you're someone who's noticing acute brain fog, maybe smells, maybe certain environments, so you're environmentally kind of sensitive, or maybe food will flare your, your brain fog. Then I really would encourage you to look upstream to where that could be coming from. Oftentimes, not exclusively, but oftentimes this can be driven by what's going on in the gut. The gut, as you probably know, is where the largest 70% of your immune cells are housed, largest density, highest concentration. And this is mainly in the small intestine. Now, if you have impaired gut function and you have high levels of permeability or leaky gut, as it's called, this can trigger brain fog. And this is something that's kind of in the gray area diagnostically. There's some research that's been looking at this, but it's not fully sort of flushed out. That being said, if you're someone listening to or watching this, who's noticed I eat something I can't think, then you should look to something going on in the GI. And we have a number of resources for you if that is a position that you're in. So do not overlook that because that is the pillar uh, or, or the foundation rather. And Hooperzine A is once you have healthy foundation, then you can supplement on top of that with something like Hooperzine A, thus enter what I think is the most salient piece of research here, a 2019 meta-analysis that gave this to individuals with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, so not truly healthy, but also not disease. So again, I think this is reasonable. And they found improvements in memory and in cognitive function scores using a dose between 100 micrograms up through 800 micrograms. Now, this is one of the areas to be careful in that more is not always going to be better here because you may risk side effects of having levels of acetylcholine that are too high. So we want to try to optimize. We don't want to try to kind of overshoot the landing or think like more is better. Let's go guns a blazing. So one to 800 micrograms and some favorable benefits shown therein with that dose. Regarding safety and side effects. Thankfully, there have been studies, this is mainly looking in Alzheimer's populations because this is where we have the most research, but finding the amount of reported side effects were the same as placebo, meaning this is a compound that's very safe. Now, we don't have long-term data and we don't have data looking at otherwise healthy individuals other than MCI. What I would infer is that the healthier you are, likely the better your levels endogenously, naturally, of acetylcholine are, therefore the less bolstering of acetylcholine you need. So we want to try to find the minimal effective dose, said another way. There are a couple medications that this are or that this compound is contraindicated with, and 
also a few situations like pregnancy where and you should not use this so always check this with your healthcare provider your doctor and or do your own research but generally very safe now as we come to the protocol we want to be thinking about the pharmacokinetics and really the half life because this is what i learned the hard way we should factor into our dosing frequency the half life is 12 hours now comparing that to other compounds nicotine is 2 hours and which by the way has some really nice neuroprotective effects when we take it out of the baby bathwater argument of vapes or cigarettes so that's important that's another topic we've done a podcast on that in the past caffeine's half life is 3 to 7 hours so this is a long half life and it may take perhaps as long as 20 to 28 hours to fully remove cuprosine from the body. It's not a bad thing, but it just tells us that if we're dosing every day, the chance that we're going to have a accrual of too much acetylcholine will be a, a viable risk. So because of that, enter the protocol that is sort of a derivative of my research, my experimentation, and what's been used in the trials and what I personally do. 200 to 400 micrograms every other day to every three days, and then stop and have a gestation week every two to four weeks. And again, this is because, and the recurring theme in biology, more is not better. We want to do something sure to maybe support, but whether it be hormones, testosterone, estrogen, too much, too much testosterone in a male, he'll feel good for a week and then he'll be crying and have ED, right? So there is a sweet spot that we want to find. So again, learn from my experience that too much can be a problem. Other things that you may notice if your levels of acetylcholine are too high is similar, roughly said, to caffeine. May not be able to sleep, may feel too sped up, uh, may have a dry mouth, may have loose bowels. So um, do this in a controlled fashion, meaning change just this one variable, and then you can assess tolerance and see what your upper threshold is, or said a better way, what the minimal effective dose for you is. Um, yeah, so I guess that's a long short. Here are two products that I think are worth considering. I don't think you have to be highly concerned with the quality assurance of Huberzine A. This didn't come up in any of my or our team's research. Maybe there's something out there that we missed, but it doesn't seem that there's uh, some sort of shady business where people are selling uh, garbage hoopers in out there. So, um, I mean, I guess go for a reputable company that follows GMP, good manufacturing practices, but otherwise you're probably okay with um, a, a whole number of, of brands. And that's really the overview on Hooperzine A. I do think it's something worth experimenting with. It does not come without any cost, not to say you run the risk of doing damage, although again, we don't have great long-term data to answer that question, but it's more so like drinking too much caffeine. It can feel good to have a little bit of caffeine stimulation. If you drink too much, you can feel jittery, anxious, not be able to sleep. So Goldilocks zone, minimal effective dose, something worth considering. And remember that this is not a solution for if you're not sleeping, if you have gut inflammation, food reactivity, environmental reactivity, look to those factors first. And then this is really a cherry on top sort of intervention. Um, okay. Well, if this has been helpful, please like, comment. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. If you have used it, what your experience has been, subscribe. And uh, hopefully this helps you get that last bit of extra cognition so you can do whatever you're trying to do more effectively. <music>